Right, so today I will give you a story, a brief history of abstract algebra, just to uh, hope, hopefully you can, can appreciate the uh, treatment of abstract setting in the modern mathematics. So in modern mathematics, <coughs> I mean, or in your mathematical learning, you start from high school math, of course, like this basic stuff, and then you learn calculus, which in some sense is like trying to do linear approximation. You zoom your graph until the point where it looks linear and you work calculations, you do calculations on those. And linear algebra in high school level, which is really just solving linear, a system of linear equations. So a very classic problem is the chicken and rabbit problems from Swanji Swanjing. So just to translate, it says that now we have some bunch of chicken and rabbits and you have 35 heads in total and 94 feet in total. So how many chickens and how many rabbits are there? So we, know, we all know that chicken and rabbit both have just one head, but then chicken has two legs, rabbit has four legs. So you set up a system of linear equation and solve this kind of stuff. In this course, we are not going to do that. We are going to do the abstract setting. <clears throat> and after this, you will learn to study uh, <clears throat> different kind of areas in mathematics. So I split out applied math, which is the <clears throat> which is the calculation that really just use computer, and I don't consider those as pure math. For pure math, there are usually uh, three main topics. One is analysis, which <laughs> is real calculation using pen and paper. And for those students who are in this class, I think you guys all have nice experience to introduction of mathematical analysis already by doing calculations on pen and paper and trying to draw this <laughs> graph from the final exam. <laughs> yes, okay, nice. So the next topic is geometry. And this is about drawing. And most of the time nowadays, we focus on 3D and 4D. So yeah, coffee cups like a donut is a very famous example. And Calabi-Yau manifold in 60 is a research area in many uh, of our faculties, like Frederick Fong, Zhang Hai Long, and, and so on. <coughs> and yeah, some nice cool animation I found on nine, like a 4D <coughs> hypercube. Yeah, Yao is uh, Yao Xingtong, I mean, famous mathematician. Harvard and Chinese U. Right. So, and of course, the last topic is uh, algebra, the, the huge topic. And if you just grab any algebra textbook at once, once, you'll see that things are pretty abstract and they are all like in symbols and there just aren't anything that you can grab the meaning. <coughs> so, in abstract algebra, you might have heard the names like groups and rings and field and <clears throat> what are all this stuff and why are we going to study this stuff well it turns out um, I, I, i'll talk about where this comes from but it turns out that <clears throat> yeah so real we don't know what's going on <laughs> but it turns out that a lot of mathematical papers nowadays actually use the language of groups rings and fields and not even in pure math, but also in applied math, this language will happen everywhere. And the main reason is from the mathematics revolution in the 19th century, about 150 years ago. Right, so to give you like an introduction of this uh, algebraic object, so we have to go back to the origin of modern mathematics. So what is mathematics? What are we trying to do for the, let's say for the ancient people? Well, of course, it's to solve equations. And the name algebra basically just comes from the algebraic term called algebra, yeah, which means reunion or in a more elaborate meaning, really just to solve equations so that the unknown variables are reun reunited with its solution. So 
I don't know where's the algebra in this <laughs> picture, but yeah, it's this is the book called the Compendious Book on Convergence by Computer and Bound and whatever. Yeah, so this is the algebra term. So what is the simplest equations that one can ask? Well, of course, the linear algebra, uh, linear linear equation, ax plus b equals zero. And what are the solutions of this uh, equation? Well, there are no solutions because ancient people do not know how to use negative number. <laughs> so instead, yeah, let's do this. And then people, ancient people know how to solve this, of course, just by b over a. So this is linear equation. And then the next step will be, of course, quadratic equations. And we all know, learn from high school that we have this quadratic formula that tells you how to solve these equations. Although this quadratic equation is already known pretty much long, very long time ago, for example, in 200 BC, like 2000 years ago, already we have examples from China in these uh, nine chapters of arithmetic that tells you a problem in quadratic equations. So just to translate, it says that we have a square city wall that we don't know the size. And if we walk north by 20 steps, we can see a tree. And if we walk south by 14 steps and then turn west for 1,775 steps, then we will also barely see the same tree. <coughs> and the question is, what is the size of this city, or of, of, this, or of this square city? And so this is really a geometry problem with a similar triangles, so you, look at the ratios of the size and the ratios of the height, and you rearrange the term and you will get a quadratic equation. And from this, we can be sure that the ancients know how to solve quadratic equations and get the answer x equals 250. But this is not the oldest known uh, uh, result because the Babylonians actually even know how to solve this equation in 1700 BC. And so this is the record in British Museums. Although it's more like a special case, so because as I said, they don't know how to use negative numbers. So this is the special case that they try to solve and they have this answer. And this is also recorded in the same algebra book that I mentioned previously. <clears throat> so in Arabic, the writing is from right to left. So the symbols are kind of mirror reflected. But you can see that the, this is the same formula more or less. All right, so now we know how to solve com uh, quadratic. So how about uh, cubic? So yeah, at that time, there are no complex numbers, of course, and not even many people know about negative numbers. So cubic equations is definitely impossible uh, to even think about. And with this, <laughs> we have to move forward for 3,000 years after this Babylonian type. There are no progress at all to solve cubic until the renaissance so here comes in the 15th century a mathematician from the uh, university of bologna so this is called uh, the pharaoh and he, somehow after 3000 years he knows how to solve a special case of this cubic equation <clears throat> so he has a student which is called Theo, and i cannot find a picture so i'll just use a uh, guy to represent him so he's the student of the pharaoh and the pharaoh is dying and he wants to tell the secret to his student. So at that time, knowing how to solve equation is really a secret weapon or a commercial secret because this is how you raise your fame by uh, challenging other mathematicians. So in, the, in this uh, middle age, your rep repetition as a mathematician is raised by participating in debates or challenges with other mathematicians, just like, yeah, challenge between two people. And actually there's a very specific format. So each person has to propose 30 problems to the other mathematicians and whoever answered the more questions win. And if he wins, then he'll get more repetition and he may be, get hired to better jobs and have a better career. So the student Fio who knows this secret uh, cubic equation uh, solving techniques from his teacher, he start to challenge other people and he chose Tartaglia, which at the time is a very famous mathematician from Venice. So 
<laughs> he wants to challenge Tartaglia. And because with his uh, cubic equation techniques, he, ans he asked all 30 questions about solving a cubic equation. <laughs> and Tartaglia, which is a, a normal mathematician, he submits uh, a different variety of questions to the student field. But he's a famous mathematician, so actually he's also a professional, and he already know how to solve another special case of cubic, x cubed plus a x squared equals b. Not exactly the same form as the one that Fio proposed, but similar enough. And in our modern days, we definitely know that if you can solve this, you can take one over x, and you will get the answer for the other type of cubic. And Tartaglia also uh, realized that. And at that night, he know how to solve both cases. <clears throat> and he's able to solve all 30 problems of Fior in less than two hours and completely defeated him. Because I mean, Fior uh, asked 30 different variety of problems and yeah, of course he cannot understand, uh, he cannot solve most of them. So this public debate turns out to be a news around Italy and a very famous uh, public mathematics lecturer called Cardano heard the news and he is so interviewed because he is trying to write a book on algebra and he previously thought that the solutions to the cubic is in, to the cubic, cubic equation is impossible and now he learned about this public debate and he learned about the fact that the cubic actually can be solved he wanted to include this solution to his new book so he find he found Tartaglia and asked him to provide the solution. But of course, this is a commercial secret, as I mentioned last time. And Tartaglia still wants to use this uh, solution to beat maybe other mathematicians or just to be secure for his debate. So this debate continued for nearly four years. I'm just picking a blanket. Until the, uh, the publisher, the Cartano, persuade Takagia by introducing him to his patron, which at the time is the governor of Milan. <clears throat> so if the governor knows you, then you, I mean, you'll get basically just better jobs and better salary and so on. So finally, Takagia accepted his offer and provide the solution to Cardano in the form of a poem in 1539. And he asked Cardano to never, never publish his solution because as I said, this is, should be a commercial secret. <clears throat> so now Cardano equipped with his solution, he quickly uh, cooperate with his student Ferrari, I mean, I mean Ferrari, and construct the solutions to general cubic, not just the special case that Tadaglia know, but more impressively, not just cubic, but they actually can generalize the solution to quartic as well. So using just Tartaglia's method, they are finally able to solve both the cubic and quartic degree four uh, polynomials. So just to give a more mathematical uh, setup uh, overview, what is the Cardano's formula? It's actually quite easy to understand. So you start with a cubic, and of course you can always normalize by dividing by eight. So <clears throat> you have a, uh, polynomial that has leading term x cubed only. And we do a simple substitution. And with this, we can remove the a from the x squared term. So this p and q will be the original a and b. In this case. So now you reduce your equation to a cubic where you don't have the x squared term. And now you do another substitution like this and do a rearrangement. So the idea is that we want to solve this u cubed plus v cubed equals minus q and free uv plus p equals zero. So if you can simultaneously solve these two equations, then of course this uh, equation is satisfied, right? Because you have two terms equals zero. But these auxiliary equations, you can uh, modify a little bit by taking a cube. So everyone should now recognize what is this. This is really just the sum of root and product of root, right? If you let alpha equals u cube and beta equals u cube. And sum of root and product of root are definitely just quadratic equations. And everyone knows how to solve quadratic equations. 
So the idea is if you solve the quadratic equation, which is called the resolvent equation, like this, then you found alpha and beta, then you found u and v, then you found t, which is the solution of your original cubic. And so this is the root of, the, of your equation. And the other two are just a slight modifications if you want. <laughs> so one can also write down explicitly what this solution in, in terms of A, B, C. And not that bad, not quite long, but not that bad. So this will be the general solution, one root of your cubic equation. And this is called the Cardano's formula. Now, how about the quartic? Well, the idea is more or less similar. So you have a quartic, you normalize, and then you do a substitution to remove the first x cubed term like this. And this time you also have some kind of resolvent equation, but not quadratic this time. It is a cubic uh, resolvent re equation constructed out of the sum modification of this quartic. But we already know how to solve cubic from the previous strategy, right? So now from quartic, we have the resolvent equation in cubic and we know how to solve them. So we plug it in and then we do this modification. And we found that the roots of the quartic equations are given by plus or minus this expression. So there are three plus or minus, but there are only like four different roots instead of eight. So this will be your original, uh, uh, this will be the solution of your modified quartic. And to write down the original uh, solution, you can use uh, Mathematica, I think, <laughs> to get the general solution for a quartic uh, polynomial. I like this, let me show one more time. All right, okay. So now the two guys know how to solve both cubic and quartic. And as I said, Cardano really wants to write a book on algebra, but because he promised Takaglia to keep the secret of his, of his solution. So both formulas need to use Takaglia's method. So uh, in some sense, he cannot publish the book, but in a trip to Bononia, they ultimately found that their Ferro, the very first Italian mathematician that I mentioned in the beginning, actually discovered the solutions earlier, not Tartaglia. And Cardano is very happy because I mean, now he has no obligation to keep Tartaglia's uh, secret because the secret is not Tartaglia's, but it's really the Ferro's. So he <coughs> published this very famous work called The Great Art <coughs> and established Cardano as a very world leading mathematician. mathematician. But of course, Tartaglia hearing this news was very furious and he offered a challenge to Cardano. And Cardano, which is now very famous because of this book, of course refused this challenge. And at the end, in 1548, he asked his assistant Ferrari to take up the challenge. And the debate is just one-sided because Ferrari clearly understood the cubic and quartic more thoroughly than Tartaglia. So this debate actually destroyed Tartaglia, and he was later fired from his lecturer job in his hometown, and a few years later just died in poverty in Venice. So it's a very tough time for mathematicians in the Middle Age, and it is a sad uh, story for Tartaglia, who discovered the cubic, but ultimately was destroyed by his own work. So this story also leads to the birth of complex number, and this is uh, discovered by Bombelli, in the 16th century. So he looked at this cubic equation, x cubed equals 15x plus four. So this is just a normal standard cubic equation. So, and, and, and you can easily check that x equals four is a solution, both sides equals 64. But if you use Cardano's formula, the one that I wrote previously, you will see that there are square root minus 121 involved in this uh, solution. And it doesn't make sense at all at the time. So what can he do about that? Well, you plug into Mathematica <laughs> and get the exact result, right? So this is not what Bombelli do, but ultimately he developed the machinery to deal with this square root of negative numbers. And this is precisely the birth of the complex numbers. So complex number was not 
<coughs> constructed out of this x squared plus one solution, but instead it is discovered because of the problem of applying Cardano's formula to cubic, because this formula that always, I mean, most of the time will involve negative square root. Okay, so that's the story up to degree four, but then, oh, sorry, but then what about higher order? So how uh, can we solve quintic equation? So can we solve equation of degree five or, or even more? So solving here means that you can only use standard arithmetic plus minus multiply divide and possibly taking radicals, taking nth roots. So this problem remains unsolved for 200 years. And everyone knows kind of the idea that in order to solve such equation, you want to translate just like the cubic and quartic to some kind of resolvent equation. But, but for the quintic, it turns out the resolvent equation has degree six. So it's even worse than the original problem and it is not helpful at all. So the first, the first mathematician who answered this question is Abel in 1824. And he concluded that the quintic or above has no solution in terms of arithmetic and taking root. However, his uh, approach is very complicated. It's like a case by case study of different uh, polynomials with different coefficients. And it was too complicated and it's always thought to be incomplete. The proof and the proof, oops, that's a typo. Then the proof is, was incomplete. So <clears throat> at last, a very smart genius shows up, which is Gawa. So many of you may have heard of his name. So Gawa observed that the resolvent equation is too complicated and he should, uh, we should be working instead on the symmetries of the roots. So he proposed this observation in the last days of his life and he has a short life, which is only like 21 year old. So this was the time during the July revolution and <coughs> Gawa was frequently arrested from political <laughs> activities. And for those who are uh, in interested, this revolution ultimately led to the Paris rebellion in Nivisera, the Hugo's uh, novel, Nivisera, two years later. So Gawa was frequently arrested. So at one day, finally he was arrested and he has to arrange a duel with a person called Pachot de Bonville, which is a rival in politics. <coughs> so he arranged a duel with him and he himself know that he must not, uh, he probably will not win the duel. So he spent the last day of his life scripting down all his mathematical uh, works so far and sent it to his friend, hopefully to bring his work to the two famous mathematicians, Jacobi and, uh, Jacobi and Gauss at that time. So these two guys. And you can see from his writing that he just hopes someone can decipher all his mathematical uh, achievement or work. Uh, so this is <laughs> another part of his script. I'm not sure how Jacobi and Gauss will read this kind of script. But at the end, he fought the duel. And just as I said, he died at the age of 21 because he just gets shot and not cured. So his theory was ultimately not read by Jacobi and Gauss, but luckily 10 years later, a mathematician called Liu Fiu found his paperwork and collect them and make a publications on the work of Gao. So after that, everyone knows of Gao's achievement. So what is Gao theory? <clears throat> In a very layman term. <laughs> so we have looked at quadratic equation and we know the solution of quadratic equation, which is some kind of plus minus square root thing. So as an example, this x squared minus x minus one gives you a golden ratio. And we see that the two roots are kind of symmetric with plus square root five and minus square root five. So it's like playing two balls where you can switch the position around. And the arithmetic involving the square root five has this symmetry, right? If you do this calculation, Square root five, and you just replace plus square root five by minus square root five, everything still works. I mean, the arithmetic still is still the same. <clears throat> so the things does not change if you, I mean, the arithmetic does not change if you switch the two 
uh, roots. And this is the first observation of symmetry. For cubic equation, you have similar thing because if you have the three roots, alpha, beta, and gamma, you can always switch the position of these roots and your equation will not change. So this is like a symmetry of three balls by permuting three different objects. And another point of view, for example, C, which is the product of roots, alpha, beta, gamma, will not change even if you in the, uh, permute the <coughs> position of these roots. So Gawao's idea is that every equation, uh, every polynomial equation will have a corresponding symmetric groups. And for quartic, you have similar observations. You have a S4 symmetry group, which is a permutation of four objects. And similarly, you have observed these coefficients A, B, C, D are all unchanged if you just permute these roots. So instead of studying resolvent equations or those kind of things, Gawao's idea is to study the symmetry of the groups. So we have seen that S2, the one that permutes only two things, is very simple. S3 is also simple. S4, okay, there's a four balls. But for S5, I cannot really draw a 4D, 4D pyramid. So this is the best I can do. For S5, it is just too complicated. And Gawao's observation is that the equation is solvable meaning that you can solve it in terms of plus minus, uh, add, I mean, add, subtract, multiply, divide, and taking roots. So equation is solvable if and only if the symmetry group associated to that polynomial equation is simple enough. In modern terms, we call these groups solvable groups, which you probably will learn it in 3131. Otherwise, you will never have a chance to learn it, I guess. <laughs> I don't think 3121 will talk about this. Yeah, so the equation is solvable if the corresponding group is simple enough. And the group he is using here is in the abstract sense, so that you are not really looking at the permutation of objects, but in an abstract setting. And this is only a tip of the iceberg of Gavard's theory, because I mean, Gavard's theory is also related to fields and many other things. So the main observation of why what is an abstract setting is that if you have two permutations, for example, if you have this S, which is permuting two balls, and another permutation, which is permuting the three balls in a counterclockwise way, then you can compose the two. You can first apply S and then apply T like this. And this, of course, is another permutation, which is the same as just permuting one and two, right? If you can compare the both sides. So permuting, Permutation is closed under product in this sense. So if you have two permutations, then if you work with one followed by the other, it is still another permutation. So you can make some kind of uh, multiplication table. So, uh, no, I don't, I don't have pen. <laughs> so for example, E is the thing that you don't do anything. So if you don't do anything both times, then of course you don't do anything, you get E. By the way, I cannot write with my mouse. So. <laughs> and if you and you think about it, if you do a counterclockwise rotation, permuting one, two, three, and then do another counterclockwise rotation again, what you really get, oops. Uh, can I erase? What you really get will be uh, E321, right? The one that is clockwise rotate. <laughs> and so on. So you can fill up this table pretty quickly and easily. Can I? Yeah, so you can fill up this multiplication table in <coughs> this way. So counterclockwise and counterclockwise will give you clockwise, clockwise, clockwise will give you counterclockwise and so on. And we also see, for example, that if you permute one, two and one, three, you'll really get uh, a clockwise uh, permutation and so on. So you kind of play this game like a Sudoku, really, it's, it's really like a Sudoku, and you can create the whole table out of just observing how you permute the balls. So the example we have just seen, if we permutate, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, here, if we permute two, three, and then we do a rotation, we'll get the result that is permuted by one, two, for example. 
but this is still a picture where we have the balls, the, the one, two, three balls in, my, in our mind. But of course, we can just give them a new symbol. For example, I can just call this T. Uh, yeah, I can just call the rotation T and the count and clockwise rotation T inverse. So that when you do a rotation and then a clockwise rotation and then counterclockwise rotation, you get back nothing, you get back E. And for example, when you do a permutation, flipping two balls, and then followed by a rotation, you will get another permutation. Uh, this example. Yeah, maybe this one, yeah. Something like that. So you can represent the previous table, these tables, using just a single T and S and represent all other stuff using the abstract, uh, <coughs> abstract symbols. So now we have the groups defined in an abstract setting. We don't have the permutations in mind anymore. But, but, but instead, we have multiplication rules. For example, S, which uh, represent uh, flipping two balls, has to go back to itself if you apply two times. And rotation, it has to go back to itself if you apply three times, and so on. And you can also think about if you flip two balls and do a counterclockwise rotation, it will be the same as first doing the clockwise rotation and then flipping that two balls. So this is a very uh, elementary observation of a symmetry group. So it is his idea that we should study abstract objects instead of <coughs> uh, the actual equation to solve uh, the main problem. And after 50 years, different people have worked on the axiomatic definition of groups. And finally, they came up with a set of rules to define what should be a group. So a group should be a set that has an operation so that you can compose the two operations so you should think about it as some kind of permutation. So if you have two permutations, then you should compose it to get a new, new permutation. And for each permutation, you, there is an identity, which does nothing. And there's also an inverse, so to undo what you, have, you are doing. So if you are rotating, then you can rotate in the other direction to go back to the identity. And finally, associativity is also a very uh, natural uh, condition because remember permutation, is really mapping a, num a set of numbers to a set of numbers. It's like, it's like a function from numbers to numbers, changing the numbers, but still a function. And we all know that composition of functions are associative. F of G of H is F of G of H. So this associativity for group is a very natural uh, condition. So there are basically three things. You have identity, you have inverse, and you have associativity. Or in Neyman term, you can multiply and you can divide in a group. So in modern mathematics, the philosophy now is that starting from these axioms or these abstract rules, we just follow them and play the game by trying to derive as many results as possible, just starting from these axiomatic rules. So now the question, uh, one, one other question is, Gawao says that quintic equations cannot be solved. What precisely does it mean? So is it means that every cube, every quintic equation cannot be solved? Well, I mean, that definitely is not the case. For example, this quintic can be factorized. <clears throat> and if you can factorize, then of course this can be solved because you can solve both uh, factors separately, right? So Gawa's correspondence means there is a correspondence between the symmetric group of the polynomials and the structure of the field extension from the roots. So we have seen that the quadratic corresponds to S2, which is just like a flipping, flipping two balls. So it's very simple. And the cubic will correspond to S3, flipping three balls. And we have seen that there's some kind of subgroup structure. For example, you can only focus on rotations. And if you do rotations, then you can always only get rotations. You cannot get flipping from rotations alone. And you can also do flipping alone. So this is flipping one, two, flipping two, three flipping one free. And this form kind of substructure called a subgroups. And this will correspond to the roots of these polynomials. So for example, the quadratic, you can see that it can be solved by including negative square root three, square root negative three into your <coughs> numbers. And for the cubic, you can solve the equation by introducing square root negative 23 and some auxiliary roots. And so the point is that for general quintic, where you have five uh, roots, the symmetric group 
is S5, the real S5, and it looks something like this, which is true complicated. And you still have the correspondence between the uh, root extension, the field extension, using the roots of this polynomial with the phase field. And this is what Gawao actually did, is to find a correspondence between symmetric groups of your polynomial and some field extension using the roots of your polynomial. And so he successfully turned a concrete problem of solving equations into studying abstract, su abstract structures and substructure, substructures of some mathematical objects called groups. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, groups means multiply, you can multiply and divide, and this leads to symmetry. But of course, you can also add more rules, like if you allow addition and subtraction and multiplication together, just like integers, for example, then what we get is a structure called ring. And there are many examples of rings, like integers, as I said, you can add, subtract, and multiply. Polynomials, of course, you can add, subtract, and multiply. And some modular arithmetic and matrix also. Matrix, you can add a matrix, subtract matrix, multiply a matrix, but you, sometimes you may not be able to divide a matrix by taking inverse. If you want to divide something, then the structure will be called a field. <coughs> So if you include division, then for example, instead of integers, you'll have rational numbers. And if instead of polynomials, you have rational functions. And there are many other examples like complex numbers. You can definitely divide complex numbers. So the main philosophy, as mentioned before, is just start, start by abstract rules and play with the game. So don't be scared about abstract algebra. It is really just doing arithmetic, but in a more general sense. So groups and fields are developed purely because of Gawao theory to solve uh, n degree uh, solvability of uh, degree n polynomials. While ring theory actually has a different history. So ring theory was mostly developed because of Fermat's last theorem. So, you know, this theorem has been uh, <coughs> troubled mathematicians for 350 years until uh, it is solved by Andrew Wiles in 1994 and his proof also used a bit of Gao theory. So yeah, I probably will not have time <laughs> to give another talk on the development of ring theory, but the main philosophy kind of uh, get together now that to study modern mathematics, we have to do abstraction. And yeah, also we also have a first day cover for Gao theory. So, so finally, the first book on modern algebra that really deals with these axiomatic uh, definitions and abstraction is this book by van der Weerden in 1930. And from that on, algebra turns from solving equations into studying abstract structures. And this is also the beginning of the axiomatic approach to mathematics. Yeah, so just a quick wrap up. So of course there are applications, for example, buckyball in chemistry, has a symmetry group of S5, actually A5, I think. And of course, number theory using the rings and fields has applications to cryptography and even just analyzing Rubik's Cube using group theory by finding commutators, for example. <coughs> and even in theoretical physics, this standard model of particle physics, all these groups appears in the study of this structure. Great, so yeah, so that's kind of the, brief introduction to the history of abstract algebra. So let's now have like a five minutes break and I'll give you more details on group rings and fields to prepare for the next lecture. So yeah, feel free to ask me any questions, unmute yourself and yeah, let's have a five minutes break. <laughs> 